Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining the Sean and Sean webinar. Um, today we have our special guest, Sean Shepard, um, who will be talking about how to generate revenue now. And as you guys know, we're all going through a turbulent time. So um, I'm honored to have Sean here to provide a wealth of knowledge and also his expertise as he's probably been through a, through a few of these turbulent times. And I'm really uh, happy to have him here with us today to uh, give us some of those tactics that he believes we all should be doing um, to continue to grow our business. So a little bit about me, um, you know, my name is Sean Finder. I am the CEO of AutoClose, been in sales for about 15 years. Um, and if you want to get in touch with me, um, Sean will just go to the next slide and he will show you guys how to um, get a hold of me. You can reach out to me on, on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm very active on LinkedIn. Um, you can also email me at Sean at autoclose.com if you would like, um, as well as Twitter. So if any, if you have any questions after the show today or after the webinar, please let me know and I will be, um, be more than happy to respond. Um, so today, as I mentioned, we have Sean Shepard. So Sean, maybe introduce yourself and then uh, we can get going. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Sean Shepard. I'm a five-time sales founder uh, with three successful exits in a wide variety of products, markets, and verticals, primarily all B2B enterprise. Um, I am the founder of GrowthX and GrowthX Academy, uh, where we invest in companies. We help them grow with our market acceleration methodology, which is really focused on developing markets and making money as opposed to developing products and raising money like most accelerators. And then GrowthX Academy is a place where we train the next generation of sales, marketing, design, and data scientists for, uh, uh, for working in, uh, in these same kinds of high growth tech startup environments in the innovation economy. Um, and, and the impetus, impetus for this was, um, it's basically the number one question I've been getting from people in the marketplace, from our startups and our portfolio, uh, from friends in, in positions of sales and marketing leadership and entrepreneurs and just generally the community at large. To Sean and their team and they built this beautiful deck with these six tactics that I basically uh, am, am advising people to, uh, uh, to try and employ or think about things a little bit differently anyway uh, right now. And I'm very much biased towards action and substance and, and, and tactics. Um, it's great to talk about things strategically at a high level and how we feel and, and um, you, know, uh, you know, how you should react and behave in, in, in moments of crisis like these. Um, but it's, I think, even more important to give you actionable advice, things that you can actually do something with and you can walk away with. And whether or not you employ all six or, you, or, or none, it's entirely up to you, but hopefully it helps you a little bit in, in how you think about things. I think just generally, um, I'll start with a comment on, on, on the current state of affairs. Um, I'm a very, very positive person by nature. I think most of us on this call are, otherwise we wouldn't be in the roles we're in. Um, I have seen, you know, many crises, quote unquote, over the years. Um, it's not a word I enjoy or even like to use. Um, it's like rejection. I don't have that word. In my <laughs> I don't have the word worry either. I changed yeah. worry to think, right? And instead of worrying, I'm thinking, I'm considering, um, I'm pondering, um, I'm postulating. Another one of my favorite words. Anyway, um, but the point is, is that, is that um, this one is a little unique and different uh, than many of the other ones. This one's very much self-imposed and it is gonna change a lot of our behavior. Uh, what it's doing is reprioritizing um, business and work uh, and how we live for everyone to a certain degree. How much of that sticks over time remains to be seen. But I do feel this is much more like 9-11 uh, than it is 2009. Um, in that uh, it will drive some new behaviors. Um, and and the, the good part of this is, is that all the digital infrastructure has existed for a decade or longer for people to adopt this work from home and, 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 this, uh, and this digital way of uh, uh, non-contactless way of communicating and going through the world. We just have chosen not to make it a priority. Uh, but now everyone's forced 
to make it a priority. So the question now is, is how do we react and respond in a way that finds the opportunity that exists in this, in this moment? I believe the Chinese word for crisis is actually a combination of two words, problem and opportunity. <laughs> and this is the time to be thinking about things in that way. Um, be grateful that you um, even have, you know, that you're safe and that you're healthy and that you have the opportunity and the time and the resources to participate in something like this. Um, this too shall pass. We won't be in this for very much longer, I don't expect. Hi guys, are you guys sure. having story? Oh, uh, yeah, the audio audio keeps cutting in and out, but I think we're okay now. Okay, there we go. Well, this is your opportunity to reflect on on uh, the kind of work you want to do and with whom and how uh, and where you want to contribute in the world. But with all of that change, um, <clears throat> you're not in a vacuum. If you're feeling it, I guarantee you the people next to you or on this call are feeling it. And if they're feeling it, I promise you, your customers and your market are feeling it too, which means there's an opportunity for you to create a new kind of narrative and a new kind of conversation with those people. And so as I dive into these six things that you can do, um, the idea is that um, the first and most important one is to start thinking about things differently. Yeah. Um, the first tactic is to orient yourself around the problem and the person that you're working with or trying to work with. Get out of the product and the role and the goals that you've set for yourself or that your organization has set for yourself. Yes, I respect they're important, but don't confine your thinking uh, and your approach to the way you've done things previously. Open yourself up and your mind to any and all possibilities and opportunities to be very fundamentally helpful to your customers and your market. Don't go out at this point and sell products and services. Go out and recruit people who, sh who feel like you, think like you, uh, and have similar um, desires to make the changes necessary to continue to be sustainably successful in the long run. So that means understanding how deep their problem is and really, really trying to focus on addressing that. Um, and again, it may have nothing to do with what your current offering is. So you've gotta be buoyant and open yourself up to what are the other ways that I can be helpful? Um, and many of those things have nothing to do with what you're currently offering. It has more to do with how strong of a relationship you've developed, the trust that comes from that, the credibility that, 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 that's been created and how you can use that to start actively solving new and unique different problems, especially for most of us who are in tech sales. Every new technology and new innovation creates a whole host of new behaviors and therefore a whole new set of challenges and problems that need to be addressed. And every time that happens, there's a new way of thinking about solving those things. Problems don't go away forever. They just change. So Sean, would you, would, would you recommend like more uh, for salespeople out there? I mean, I guess now at times with everything, it's more consolidative selling where you want to go in and not really sell your product or solution. But go in, for example, say you sold a sales tool, maybe go in and help them with deciding on what CRM they might want to go forward with, et cetera. So really helping them with the whole sales stack and not just focusing on that salesy approach where you're just focusing on your product, but trying to be more of a mentor and, and almost an educator for them. Yes. I think you need to be an advisor. You need to be a friend. You need to be um, a therapist. Uh, you need to be everything to your customer that you are to the people that are closest to you in this world. 100%. And this is your opportunity to express and demonstrate some leadership. In every crisis, there's a back. Looks like the audio cut out again quickly. Uh, and start to open up your mind and your mindset to, I don't know what I don't know yet. And what I don't know is more important than what I do, but I do have a series of questions that I'd like to ask to start a conversation, to see where it leads us. And through the course of actively listening to that, you can identify opportunities to solve problems. They may be problems you have no business solving yourself, 
um, or, or even have the expertise to solve. But that's not what matters right now. What matters is, is, how, is you, how can you be as helpful as possible uh, to the people in your world and community? Yeah, and just to add to that, Sean, I, I find that one thing is, you know, sometimes when you help somebody with my, what, something that might not be your product or service, they might not be ready for your product or service today. But I will tell you, four months from now, when the time comes and they are, you know, doing an RFP with your product, you're the one that's going to come to mind because you might have helped them in the past and might have helped them with, with another problem that they had. So I do think building those relationships, it all comes up to down to building those relationships early so that when they need you, you're there for them. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Com completely 100% correct. I like to make the joke that we're not looking for Mr. Right. We're looking for Mr. Right now. Yeah. Um, what's an immediate need? And that actually moves us into tactic two nicely, Sean. Um, thanks for teeing that up. Um, it's now once you've opened up that mind, what do you do with that? What do you do with the feedback you're collecting through the course of those conversations with your customers? You've now started a dialogue, hopefully. And it's a very dynamic dialogue and it can go in a whole host of different directions. But you should be actively listening for the problems that you think you can solve for right now. And it doesn't necessarily have to be with your product where it is today. It can be in some other way. Um, I wrote an article once uh, that, that's been pretty popular on why I, call, why I believe SaaS should be called ser service as a software, not software as <laughs> a service. And the reason is, is because as somebody who's built and sold SaaS companies and then invested in many of them, where I found uh, the most success in, in my investments as well as in my own startups is, is when we have a service first mindset. Yep. Um, and we build a product based on trying to automate a manual process that we either have performed ourselves um, or have been actively involved in trying to work flow and understand for those people. And that also means that you can charge a service oriented price for providing a service. You don't just have to sell somebody a product. If they need your help, as you said, in a consultative way, Sean, to come in and map out a marketing and tech stack, map a customer journey, come up with opportunities and ways to shorten their sales cycles, um, reduce the friction in their funnel, um, all of those things. Well, figure it out. Uh, you may not be a UX designer yourself, but I bet you have one on the team that might be able to help you help your customer. And I know with time and materials, it's not hard to charge for that and it's easy for people to budget for it. So that's an example. What can you solve for right now that someone is surfacing? in the course of your conversations. And again, it may not be very specific to what you're currently offering, but if you know how to do it or you have the resources that you can bring to bear, take the opportunity uh, to do that. Find the pebble in their shoe that, that hurts them right now, where they have a discretionary ability to do something about it. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, Sean, I, I know one thing that I always look for, especially when we're doing our product roadmap is, if you have a client that has a big challenge or a big problem, you better believe that there's probably at least a handful, a dozen, 20, 30 clients that have the exact same problem. So you might be solving that one problem for them, but I'm telling you, if you look at your entire client base, there's probably a lot of people that have the similar problem. So I always tell people, especially when you are building a product, and I, I like that I've never heard of service as a software, but that's, it's, it's true. You want to build those features and those products on what your clients tell you they need. Don't do it on what your product development necessarily says, but try and do what your clients ask because a lot of your clients will have the same issues. Together, what you're doing is, is you're opening up your mind and creating an opportunity for a conversation in tactic one to surface these problems. In tactic two, you're trying to pinpoint a very narrow set of, of a subset of problems that you can solve for, and then a smaller, more short-term um, cohort that you can help. Because don't forget, you might be one person or one group of people. How many people can you help over the next three months, six months, two months, one month? Um, find those people and narrow your focus down to a highly concentrated group that you think you can help right now. And then go out with your team and brainstorm around building a customer profile um, that, that you can address for today. 
this whole thing is about generating revenue now. This is not about some long-term strategy um, that's going to get you out of this mess. This is about what can you do right now today to continue to generate revenue. So that is finding people with an immediate need that you can solve for well, regardless of what you have to offer today, um, that have that need now. So this is all about the traditional process of developing a customer persona, buyer persona, with a specific use case and problem set that's really easy for you to talk about. Um, and then the whole idea is to focus on the problem that they have, assess it out, gain mutual agreement on how they describe what that problem looks like, um, and then start the process of developing uh, a narrative around that. And then through the course of developing that narrative, what you're really trying to do is attract and recruit the right kinds of people today that have that problem now who raise their hand and go, yeah, I'm dealing with this. Um, and start to have that conversation um, in a way that uh, allows you to start to think about how you would do the job for them. And this is where I love the jobs to be done framework. You can think about this in terms of um, what job are you or your product or service being hired to perform for your customer? And if you wrote it out like it was a job description, what would it look like? If your customer was literally going to post a job description that said, I need somebody to do X, Y, and Z, and this is the roles and the responsibilities and the knowledge, skills, and experience necessary in the background, and uh, this is how they're going to get measured, et cetera. What would that look like? Put it together with them. That's called scoping the work. Um, and then you ask yourself, will they hire me or can they hire me to do that job for them today, even if it's just in the short term and it may even be in a service-based uh, model as opposed to a product-based uh, model. One of the best pieces of advice I ever got from a very successful person, an owner of a professional sports franchise who came from nothing said, you know how I got here is I found jobs that other people didn't like to do and I offered to do them for them. And if, and if you're in survival mode, um, that's one of the best ways uh, for you to uh, capture um, opportunities now. And those opportunities will always lead to other opportunities if you deliver. Because again, it's not about what you're selling now. It's about what your customers need right now. And it may be something entirely different than what you're used to. So think about it as what job are they hiring you to do? Or what job do they need to hire someone to do? And don't forget, there's never been a better time for them to hire contract help. Variable costs and variable expenses are very hot right now to use a, you know, uh, <laughs> a Will Ferrell uh, uh, a quote from yeah. Zoom. Um, variable costs are really hot right now. Um, so that means that offer yourself up as a low risk, um, high value variable option for your customers today. Yeah. And you know, speaking about buyer's persona, I know, uh, I have a lot of calls with people and, and they say, well, I think my buyer's persona is the CEO of the company, or they might say the VP of sales. But I think that, you know, the, the main thing, and, I, and tell me if I'm wrong, Sean, is each person has a different pain and each person has a different game. A CEO might not care how many demos that VP of sales is getting, but they're going to be worried about what's the revenue that that VP of sales is getting me overall. And where VP of sales might not concern about revenue, but trying to make sure their SDRs get enough demos. So I think one thing, I, it, doesn't, it takes time. You have to really find out who is your buyer's persona. And tell me if I'm wrong, you can be changing your buyer's persona depending on where we are in the economy, even during this turbulent time. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought it up because we use a framework called job, pain, gain, user, and metric yep. to, to build out that customer profile at this yep. stage. What job are you being hired to do? What's the pain associated with the way it's currently being done today? What gain would be realized if they hired you to do the job? And do that, and then how would you measure and prove with a metric um, that you actually did realize that gain in a quantifiable way. And then finally, you have to do it for every user type slash buyer type in the organization that has a job to perform because their perception of it or, how, or the nuance of how they do it can be slightly different. And certainly how they're measured and how they talk about the gains that are made from making those changes um, 
are also very unique and different. So you need to understand those. So run people through that framework. Yep. Job, pain, gain, metric, and user. And if you do that, you can build a series of profiles and do it in an account-based fashion if you need to because you've got multiple buyer types and multiple user types with different jobs uh, inside um, of an organization. So tactic four is now once you've performed that, you need to construct what I like to call a value hypothesis around the problem and the person. And it creates a narrative, right? And the narrative essentially says, look, we're all dealing with this problem today based on the, the world around us. And when you name the enemy, by the way, never na name the enemy as a person. It's, it's, a, it's a system, it's a thing, it's a circumstance, it's a condition because you can never name an enemy as, a, as an individual um, without fear of, of, of you know, insult or, um, or offense. Um, you know, it's not your customer's fault that things suck right now. Um, it is the circumstances of the environment which has created this opportunity to solve this set of problems that are associated with the way things currently are today. So, Using that framework of positioning yourself with a narrative that says, because of today's environment, you know, this world has changed. And as a result, these problems exist. And here's how we would help you solve those problems. And then this is how, this is what we think, hypothetically, that would result um, from you making that change by hiring us. And then here's how we think you can measure it. And oh, by the way, I'm doing something similar for someone else or we have done it sim something similar for someone else and show that that referenceability is there as well, okay? And don't, and then as you do this, you need to consider the risk profile of those customers that you're talking to. Um, don't offer up high risk value propositions or high risk propositions to low risk people. Um, offer up low risk propositions to low risk people and high risk to high risk people and medium to medium. Mm -hmm. um, you have to match the proposition, the risk profile of the proposition to the risk profile of your buyer. You may have middle managers who have never in their life bought anything that hasn't been proven or already in the mainstream for years. Um, you need to recognize that. Offer them something that they can consume in a very low risk way. Um, you might have others that are in complete radical change and they're open to any and everything right now. Um, and those are the ones that you might be able to take a flyer with, uh, but match that risk profile, um, to what that looks like. So in short, tactic four is all about what's the use case. Once again, how are people going to use my product or service in this instance? Uh, why would answer the question? Why would someone hire you to do the job as opposed to continuing to do it the way they do it or hiring someone else? Um, and don't be afraid during the course of this conversation to pivot. It's important to note that in the startup world, you know, 70% of seed stage companies fail. And 80% of the reasons they fail have to do with markets and people, not products or technology. Um, and the ones that do succeed, of the ones that do, over 50% uh, pivot at least once uh, on their journey uh, from seed to A or seed to break even. A third pivot at least twice. So we're talking about changing the entire strategic approach in the product in, in a given market, and what problem you're solving for entire organizations. All I'm asking you to do here is keep an Looks like the audio is, uh, is the off next the step. Oh, there we go. Yeah. The next step is uh, in order for people to make change in difficult times like this, you need to make it stupid easy for them to do it um, because change isn't the only constant in the world. The resistance to change is. <laughs> um, and right now we're all forced to accept a certain level of change. That's the only time people en masse really accept it is through force, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to make it easy for them to accept it. People don't want more work, they want less. So as you start to scope out what the work looks like 
and how you would actually validate for them that you can do the work, you need to define what that proof of concept would look like. Mm -hmm. And you need to do that for them, propose it to them, talk through it together and gain mutual agreement on what's the work, for whom, how it's going to be performed, how we're gonna know in, instantly with leading metrics and how we're gonna know over time with lagging metrics, if it's working, um, and, and what that potential after story looks like as a result. This is all part of the work from home age, guys. I got dogs. <laughs> Laura Bell, shush. Um, you're lucky the big German Shepherd's not here right now. Uh, that'd be even worse. Um, so that's the idea around tactic four. Construct a value hypothesis, but also be very tactical and specific about it. And yeah, do it yeah. on behalf of your customer. This is how your actions follow your words when we talk about you leading your customers uh, down the right path. And then the next one everybody always asks me about is, okay, how do you charge for it? This is yeah, different. Yeah. This might not be, um, this might not be, you know, your traditional um, subscription model. You might be doing something different. So how do you actually start the monetization process when you solve their problem? So the first question that you ask your customer, no, don't ask yourself, ask your customer, what's the fastest and easiest way for us to do business together today? Tell me about that. Does that involve procurement? Does it involve calling this a budget line item that you need to call it so that you can get approval for it? Uh, does it involve other people? Who are they? What role do they play in this? So go through it live together. Don't do this stuff via email, mm -hmm. okay? Um, you need to do, and we'll talk about that in tactic six in a minute, when we talk about how you're gonna execute um, outbound against this strategy. Um, but I am going to highly encourage everyone now more than ever to stop relying on screens uh, and asynchronous communication and rely on screens for synchronous live communication. This is your opportunity to spend yeah, more yeah. time more deeply with your customers, okay? Um, so the idea is, once again, go through that conversation with them. What's the fastest and easiest way for us to do business together today? Um, let's talk through it um, and then talk about from your side to help them think about it. Here's how I'm helping others like you. Um, and then make sure that you start to charge or you propose a fee structure that is based on the way that they are used to spending money right now. Don't, don't try and force people down your path. You need to walk down theirs because a big, we all know this, right? How people buy is a huge friction point and or point of contention that we have to deal with in the bottom of our sales funnel on a daily basis. And it's very easy for us to forget that, um, that our customers have a procurement process. In fact, CB, um, uh, the corporate executive board, every year polls the top enterprise buyers. And the number one frustration <coughs> that their enterprise buyers express is that sellers don't ex uh, seemingly respect their buying process. It's not that we're doing it intentionally. We're just very much focused on ourselves and our own goals and the things that we want to get accomplished. Um, and we forget that if we just understand how to navigate that maze sooner, um, we need like a Google Ways for the buying process, right? In these big companies, it just tells us the fastest path to get. Yeah. I think we lost audio again. Um, Sean, I do have a question for you. Um, I know you mentioned, you know, the easiest and fastest way um, to move forward. Now, do you, what do you, what is your opinion on pre-qualifying at, at the beginning? So if you, if you get in touch with somebody and you're trying to get the fastest, easiest way, but that person's not the end decision maker, do you try and get the decision maker on the phone or on an email, or do you, you still do that presentation to that person, even though they might not be making the decision? Sean, was that a question to me? I'm sorry, you broke up there a little bit. Oh yeah, that was a question to you. So I was asking, you know, we, we meant, you mentioned that I like it, the easy, what is the easiest and fastest way you can do business? Um, but what I'm saying, what I was asking is if you have the wrong person, that decision maker is not on the phone 
it's somebody else that's on the phone, but you're on the phone and you, you don't know if you should do a demo, you should do a product, or you should be talking to them because they can't make the decision. Do you still do that demo with them? Or do you say, why don't we set up another call and get the decision makers so we can move forward quickly? So I would, so my general philosophy around all of this has always been the last thing you do is a demo, not the first. Yep. So, and we'll talk about that in tactic six, but if you're, ha if you're running this conversation the right way, Sean, yep. that shouldn't even be a thing. Agreed. Because what you should be doing is having this conversation by now, if you're down into the fifth tactic, you're preparing yourself for that conversation, right? Yep. Tactic six is about creating the opportunity for you to have tactic five, four, three, two, and yeah. one. Yes. Okay. So, so the point is, is that you should be at the bottom of the funnel in tactic five, where you've already clearly identified a set of problems that you think you can yep. solve for. Now you want to figure out how you can solve them it, and do business, right? Yep. So by then you should have already mapped out who those decision makers are, what's going on and who's involved. Got it. Um, but it's a great question. We're going to talk about that in a second. But once again, it's about charging people the way they're used to paying, make it super easy for them. Oftentimes that just really comes down to non-product based um, fees. And so when you're not thinking about product based fees, you're thinking about labor based fees. So if you're going to spend, it was going to take you a hundred hours to solve somebody's problem. What would you be able to charge per hour for that if you were a consultant? Do the math and work your way back um, and try and create opportunities for you to generate revenue in new and interesting and different ways. Because there's really just two kinds of monetization, right? There's two, there's two components to a pricing model. There's product-based pricing and then there's uh, service-based pricing. And so you might need to do a blend um, or you might need to make adjustments to work with and operate within these folks uh, a budget. Don't complicate this stuff. You need, as I said, if you want to get people to change, you have to make it as easy as possible. And then don't be afraid to walk away and say, the timing isn't right. No is always the second best answer in sales. Always. And it doesn't mean no forever. It just means not now. And so when you develop that customer profile that we talked about in the previous tactics, in tactic three, you need to be super, super narrow. And your job now is to just recruit and find people who fit those criteria. It's not try and force a square peg into a round hole that's been created because of COVID. Okay. Um, so then once you've done that, it's time in tactic six to conduct a focused live as possible. As I mentioned, campaign, I don't care what channels you use, but use channels that allow you to have a live interaction. Even if it's standing six feet away with a mask on, I don't care. But the idea is to get humans talking to other humans and uncovering real problems that you can solve for today. We get very much focused on our area of expertise and that one particular set of products or offerings that we have. And then we don't get much below that surface. And I can tell you from doing this for 25 years, the first piece of advice I give to every new product that goes to the market is spend more time with fewer customers solving deeper problems, not the other way around. And if you do that, you're gonna, re you're gonna reduce the risk of the product and you're gonna have a referenceable market. It's no different here because the whole dynamic is about doing something different than what you've done before. And that changes things. So that changes your approach, changes your style. It changes the customer profile in the short term. Uh, it changes how you talk about it and how you uncover those needs. Um, so focus on and reach out to the people that you have the best relationships with that you can leverage or are closest to the bottom of your funnel to start having these conversations. That's where you're gonna get the most opportunity where trust already has been established. Who have you already delivered for? Who's open to having those conversations? Um, and so how you do that Looks like the audio uh, cut off again. Um, and I call it a conversation framework, not a script. I hate scripts. 
scripts are very much one way. They don't allow for the, dyna the human dynamics of people to take conversations in different directions. So you think about it like talking points. And so I love to use the spin framework. And um, I'll just give you all a little bit of background on this. I've probably read and studied as many uh, sales models and methodologies as any human on the planet. I'm a complete <laughs> wonk and geek about this stuff. And I love every one of them because they all are well-intentioned for the most part when they're used for good. And I've learned a lot from each of them. But what I will tell you is somebody who specializes in the idea of taking something someplace new. It's not about a B2B model or B2C model or a product or a service or a widget or hardware or software or the financial so selling into an industry or vertical or sector. It's all about the learning experience that happens between a couple of humans. So to me, everything is H to H. And so when you think about it in that way and your job is to construct a hypothesis and see if you can actually generate, validate that you can generate value, um, you need a fast, efficient way of doing that. Um, and so I love the spin framework from Dr. Neil Rackham and his team because I think it applies in every situation when applied correctly. And I also know that the data supports it. He didn't just come up with some fancy phrase and, and do his whiz bang salesy thing. The guy's a scientist, he's a PhD, he spent 10 years uh, observing and surveying over 35,000 sales interactions of all different shapes and sizes and products and markets and verticals. And he came up and understood the way that people buy and a way to determine whether or not they have a true need because people will not buy if they don't recognize a need themselves. If they don't realize it's the truth, it's not the truth. You might think they need it. You know they need it. That's why you're calling them. But it doesn't mean they know it. And until they experience that for themselves, until they touch the stove while it's hot and get burnt, it's not true. So how do you help them? Sounds horrible. <laughs> how do you help them touch the stove? <laughs> how do you help burn your customer? No. Um, <laughs> there, there's a framework that they developed. It's an investigative questioning framework, and it's called SPIN, and it stands for the situation, problem, implication, and need payoff types of questions that you need to ask to help somebody realize on their own while you're present if they truly do, in fact, have a need that is great enough right now to do something about. Because if they have a need, they will act. If they do not, they will not. The worst part about that is, is if they don't have a need, they might still waste your time and resources if you let them. So you have to be careful about that. Because the buying process is they have to recognize a need, then they evaluate their options, then they get their concerns resolved, and then they make a decision. But they will evaluate options, and they will run you around a concern wheel and never make a decision if they don't recognize a need. And so we tend to gloss over that. And we want to spend all of our time helping them understand the value of a need, the need payoff. But the reality is, is that if we don't help them set up a situation and recognize the problems and then the implication of that on them or their business, they're never going to get there. Um, and what Rackham noticed about the best sellers was, is they spend 80% of their time on needs development. And when they understand and help a customer explicitly recognize that they do in fact have a need and they understand how to talk about it, then it becomes real. And then the sale goes much, much faster. So the idea is it's a situation. Start asking the questions, right? You contact them with your value hypothesis and you say, I think I can help you in this way because I've helped other people like that. I'd love to know what, if, if, what's going on in your world and whether or not that's true. How is this happening or working for you today? What are you experiencing? What are you going through? Mm -hmm. And then as they start to talk to you, now you listen for the problems associated with their current situation that you think you can solve for right now. Okay? And continue to look at that and dig deeper. Tell me more about that. Help, that, help them reveal and understand and clarify the problems and issues that they're having associated with the way things are being done today. And then once you've built an argument together and gained mutual agreement that there's more than one problem going on here, um, what's the impact of those problems on you and your business? What are they emotionally? What are they logically? What are they financially? How do you quantify the problems? 
and how big are they, right? And what's the cause of it? I call it diagnose, explain, correct, right? You diagnose the issue, you together explain and articulate it in a way everybody understands it, and then you propose a corrective action, okay? So once you've done that, then um, what would be the benefit of them making a change? Not necessarily with you or towards you, but just making a change in general. It's much more disarming and much more honest when you can talk about it in a hypothetical way or allow your customer to. Because we live in a world now where people don't like to tell us the truth if it creates more work or conflict. So you need to create a safe way and place for that dialogue um, to occur. Now, the next question people always ask me is, is, well, what if they bounce from one to the other? Let them. That's why it's a framework. You start with a situation. If they want to go straight to needs recognition, fantastic. But you better document problems and you better understand the impact and how to measure it if you're going to help them. Because sooner or later, it will all come back into a focus where both of you are going to have to gain mutual agreement on, based on the way we do things today, these are the problems that are associated with it. This is the impact it's having on me and my organization. And if I made these changes, this is what, these are the benefits we could realize. And if we do that together, then we can have that conversation about what's the fastest and easiest way to do business together. And be super, super narrow so that you can determine at the end of this conversation whether or not you want to spend any more time with them today. It's not forever and it isn't personal. It's about you having limited time and resources and the opportunity of cost associated with, with allocating your time and resources towards people who express interest but don't have the ability to do business. Because you have to look at not just the willingness, but the ability. Mm -hmm. And if they... Looks like the audio is off again. this stage there we go perfect uh, i think uh yeah we can hear you again we had a little audio issue sorry bud um sorry about the audio issues i hope uh, i hope we got most of tactic six did we pick it up we did yes we did we're, we're okay all right so then i just want to leave everybody with this thought and then we can do q a um in times like these it's not the people who have the most and have the most resources that win, it's the people who are most resourceful. And you need to just hang in there and use this opportunity to rethink everything and get creative. Because if you don't, yeah, you might not survive this, but you really won't survive the bots because the bots don't have an ounce of creativity. <laughs> um, they're not coming up with ideas. They're not brainstorming. They're not emotionally connecting with people. That's you. You want to separate yourself from the world of AI. You need to have great EI. And this means you just have to be resourceful. Hack your way through it. Figure it out. Give your customers confidence that they can work through problems with you. And I'll, from that, that I'll put it back to you, Sean. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Sean. That was uh, a wealth of knowledge, like I told you guys. Um, you know, those six tactics, I think, are, are things that you can use definitely, um, you know, real time, especially now during this turbulent time, but also that spin framework, I think, will be useful to a lot of you. So, uh, Sean, if we can just go to the next slide quickly. Um, by the way, Sean, maybe just let everyone know how they can get a hold of you or the best way to get a hold of you um, if they have any questions or information. We'll take some Q&A in a second, but uh, maybe let them know the best way to get a hold of you. Sure. You can, you can, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. You can follow me on Twitter, Sean A. Shepard. Um, you can email me directly um, at sean at growthx.com and I'm happy to uh, spend time with you, speak to your team, provide advice. I know this is a difficult time for everyone right now um, and I have, I'm normally on the road 80% of the time. Um, so right now I've got, I've got time and, and I want to give back. So any way I can be helpful, let me know. You, you must miss that backyard when you're traveling 80% of the time. <laughs> We're very blessed, but um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Well, guys, um, we're going to open up for some questions so you guys can start writing any questions you guys have for Sean. Uh, we'll stay on here for a few minutes. Also, in the meantime, 
Um, if you guys want some of the resources we have, here's some resources. Um, you can probably click on the link um, if, you, if you want to download any of the books. Um, also, I'm sure Sean, if you go to his website, has a ton of resources you guys can use. Uh, we also will be recording this, so we will send out a recording to everyone. So if you did drop off for any reason, we will. But uh, let's open the floor to any questions anybody has um, for Sean or Sean. Um, we're here for you guys for the next few minutes as well. Sorry about all the audio problems. I had no idea that was going on. Yeah, it, it, it was weird. It would go out a little bit for about 15 seconds, then come back. But uh, besides okay. that, we were, um, we were okay. Any questions, guys? Oh, I see some questions. Here we go. A question on the demo. Uh, hi, Amy. A question on the demo. Um, oh, it's a typo. Okay. Just let me know, um, and I can ask Sean uh, the question you have. We've been trying to do exactly everything you've been talking about. Good to hear others thinking along the same path. Well, that's great. Um, Thanks, uh, Jeff. That means a lot coming from you. You're pretty smart and, and obviously a good expert. In the and also, also a Sharks fan. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, Amy, we're going to wait for your question. It looks like you're typing something. Oh. Uh, Javad asked, could you provide examples of leading – and lagging metrics? Oh yeah, great question. So um, this is really important, especially if you're trying to demonstrate, your goal is to demonstrate value as quickly as possible, right? Anytime you start to engage with a customer. So a leading metric is something that is instant. So let's use, uh, and a lagging one comes over time. So let's use, um, we can use autoclose as an example, right? Sean, what, uh, what would a leading metric be? Like activity, right? So immediate outreach, number of, number of emails sent, is a leading metric that shows what happens and then how quickly someone opens it and then reads yeah. it and clicks on it. Those are leading metrics. Lagging metrics might be, how does that affect the conversion at the bottom of the funnel over time? And then what does that do for the bottom line of my business? Does that make sense? Sean, you have any examples? Yeah, no, I, I, would, I would just say, you know, you have all those metrics. You have a few leading and a few lagging. Obviously you've got to keep track and, um, and analyze each one but the, you know, one leads to the other. So I think you said it perfectly, Sean. Yeah, and I think people skip over the leading metrics and don't, don't tend to emphasize them enough early in the onboarding and usage of a, of, of a business relationship because they're so focused on the long-term value because we see the long-term value as the way to charge more. Um, but, you, but adoption rates, you know, adoption, I like to say selling begins after the contract's been signed. And this is where an opportunity for that to happen yep. occurs. Like you've got to coach and lead your customers into looking at the things that are going to lead to that long-term value instantly because they need it too. They're making a bet, taking a risk on you as well. And they've got to tell the story to their stakeholders uh, about why this is working and how. Yeah. And just to add to that, Sean, I know one thing that, you know, we, we really try to focus on is, you know, customer success, because Sean, you know, as Sean said, once you have the client there, there's a lot you can do with the client. And if you teach them how to use your product or service correctly in the future, that could be an upsell opportunity. Um, and even, even if you go from one business to other, they'll always trust you. So I think, um, you know, one thing people need to take from that is that just because you make a sale, you don't, you know, wipe your hands clean. Um, it actually just starts when that happens. Uh, looks like we have another one. Let's see what, uh, oh. What if your demo is required to generate interest? I have a virtual platform for companies who are laying people off to help their employees recover from jobless and get back to work. Seeing it as a game changer, I feel it's open doors. Can you show it earlier in this case, or is that a risk? It's not necessarily a risk. If you can come up with a very short video that allows people to see it, if it's that elegant and simple, um, that you can push out as a link uh, to initiate conversations, um, then do that. Um, part of your value hypothesis sometimes can be talking about that, but a lot of this has to do with how you tell your story and how you position it. If you take a product first approach, people are going to be focused on your product. Yeah. You need to take a problem first approach and say, I've got a way to solve for your employment issues or for the layoff issues or, you know, insert X, X, Y, Z. Yeah. But it's very much about what you do for someone, not what you do. And then once you get their attention on that, 
then it's, ooh, that's interesting, tell me more. And then you go into, okay, great, I'm, I'm gonna show you this, but why don't you tell me about your current situation? How are you handling and dealing with the layoffs today? What are the problems associated with it and the impact on your business? Because then when you give the demo, you can focus the demo very specifically on the problems that they're feeling, highlight those first, you can get to the rest of it over time. But what you're really trying to do is hone in on the things that are relevant to them. Perfect. Um, oh, looks like we have one more. Oh, thanks, Amy. How much do you rely upon sales copy to tell your story? I rely on it, and I rely on it really in, in two ways. Um, I rely on it to, great, to create opportunities for conversation, to get attention, to build that po positioning in the narrative and the story. Here's the big problem that exists and here's how we're solving it. And these are the results you can see. And here's others that have done that. And then the other is in, is in, in richer, deeper content that helps build credibility and thought leadership for you. Um, so whether that's white papers, uh, user stories, case studies, um, um, driving a narrative. There's this amazing new tool out there in, in the interest of, I'm, I'm invested in it and I love it. It's called Edge Theory and they, Edge Theory has a product called the Soundboard. If you go to edgetheory.com, you'll see it. It's a place for you to go collect by topic or keyword, all the conversation that's going on on the internet around that topic or keyword. And then it uses AI and machine learning to automate content creation for you that you can push out as a sales or marketing professional to your audience to drive conversation the way you want to drive it. It's super cool. Um, and it's something, I think it's, I think it's kind of a modern new to sales tool because you don't need an expensive content marketer to do all this stuff for you. Um, mm -hmm. and it's, it's automating what auto close does for, for, you know, for the sales and marketing <laughs> process. This does it for the content creation process. And um, content is king nowadays. So it's very important. But all, again, very specific, relevant content around that story that you're yeah. trying to create. Perfect. And then the rest of your sales story and your copy is around that conversation framework. Get live conversations going and have them with no agenda other than to try and understand somebody's problems. Perfect. Well, it looks like those are all the questions. We're almost at the top of the hour here. Sean, I want to thank you so much. I know we've been talking a lot about doing a webinar. We're probably gonna have to have another one. We had such a good attendance here. I wanna thank you so much for uh, coming and you know, just providing as I said, a wealth of knowledge, six tactics, the spin framework, and answering all the questions from the audience. So uh, thank you so much for coming in today. It was my pleasure, brother. Anything I can do to be helpful to the, to the industry and the profession, I'm happy to do it. Perfect, guys. Guys, if anyone has any questions for Sean, you guys know how to get a hold of him. If you have questions for me, you guys have, know how to get a hold of me. I hope everyone uh, enjoys the day, enjoys the week, stays safe, and we'll, uh, we'll talk to you guys soon.